Uh, we are back in the book of Mark. So uh, if you have your Bible, we're going to turn over to the book of Mark. Uh, or you can grab the blue Bible on the seat in front of you, and you can turn to page 815. Uh, or there should be one of these, Mark journals somewhere nearby. If you didn't have yours or didn't bring yours with you, if you don't have one, uh, grab it. It's great for like highlighting. It's got one page of scripture, one page for notes on this side. So it's really, really awesome uh, in that regard. Uh, and uh, this is what I'll be teaching from. So if you want to follow along word for word, this will be where I'm at. Uh, in there, it's page 28. Uh, I want to let you know, uh, starting today, uh, for the foreseeable future, we've decided to take the scriptures off of the screen, okay? Uh, so we, uh, and I want to I explain why we're doing that. We'll have cross-reference texts up there, but the, uh, the actual verses of the Bible will not, that we're, that the main text that we're looking at will not be up there, and there's a couple reasons for that. First, uh, we really believe that biblical literacy is something that we want to strive for as a church. Uh, and as a community. And unfortunately, there are many people who attend church or go to church, uh, and no fault of their own, just haven't navigated through the Bible a whole lot to know where things are, right? You navigate through the Bible, I say open to Romans, and a lot of people can't do that. And there's, that's no, there's nothing wrong with that. We just want to help fix that problem. And, uh, and so we want you to know that like, it, that, that's our goal. Our goal is to help and, and help you grow as a follower of Jesus to know the scriptures better and engage with the physical text. All right. Uh, also want to challenge you to bring your Bible with you. If you don't want to use one of ours, uh, uh, if you don't own one, take one of ours. It's, it's a gift. Um, but if, if you own a Bible, bring your physical Bible with you to engage the physical text. Um, some of you, I know, rely a lot on your phone for Bible reading and things like that. Again, nothing wrong with that. However, it does present problems when you start to get a calendar notification that reminds you to take your pills in the middle of the church, okay? So what, I, what I'm saying is, is that your phone is great for multitasking, but it's not great for just staying focused on God. And so if you pull out your smartphone and it starts sending you text messages and it starts giving you all of these notifications, you could easily get distracted from something God wants to say um, to you. And so I just encourage you, challenge you, engage with the physical text. Bring your Bible with you. Use one that we have here provided. We're trying to make it easy by giving you the page numbers, uh, but we really want you to engage with the physical text if we can, all right? So that's, that's just something we're trying to do to help our church grow in this way, uh, and hopefully you guys can understand that and see that as actually a good thing and not as like, oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> Those evil, those evil people, you know, They're trying to get us to learn the Bible. Oh, <laughs> doggone them. All right. Anyway. All right. I need to ask God to have mercy on me as we pray uh, for, for this text because it's, it's a lot. And so I just want to uh, pray real quick. So if you will, just bow. God, thank you for today. And um, God, I do pray that uh, you have mercy on uh, me uh, as I handle your word and uh, have mercy on us as we try and apply it and put it into practice. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, verse one, chapter five, verse one. It says, they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. This is, uh, this is interesting, uh, to say the least, right here. Um, the idea that we're looking at, um, at least in this passage, uh, is, is Jesus moves uh, through the sea. So if you remember where we left off in chapter 4, Jesus had gone through the sea, uh, a storm on the sea with his disciples, right? And his disciples get really scared and they wake Jesus up and they're like, Jesus, you gotta help us. And so Jesus comes up and he calms the storm uh, and, and then they keep moving forward on the sea to the other side. And where they get to is this place that's called the country of the Gerasenes. Why this is significant? Well, this is Gentile country. 
Okay, uh, up until this point in the book of Mark, Jesus has been engaging with uh, people of uh, Jewish faith and Jewish tradition. Now he's moving into a region where people don't know the God of the Bible and don't know anything about Jesus or anything about a Messiah. Okay, so this is just a different group of people. They're not bad people, they just don't know. Okay, it's important that we understand that people who don't know about Jesus, that does not make them bad. It just makes them like part of the world who doesn't know, okay? And, and this is one of those things. Jesus goes to people who do not know him uh, to reveal himself to them. That's something that like, is just right here. Uh, if you just look at verse one, he's moving to a place where he hasn't been. People do not know who he is and, and don't even, aren't even really expecting him. He shows up, and what happens is this guy with an unclean spirit uh, or impure spirit uh, or, or demon possession, if you want to think about it that way, walks up to him. Now, um, this is significant because earlier in the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 1, we see Jesus' first act after his baptism is to release a man from demon possession. So as he begins his ministry to a group of people who do not know him and he has no following whatsoever yet, he starts with a, with a guy who's been possessed by a demon in chapter one. Now he goes to another region where no one knows him yet and the first thing that happens is a man with a demon possession walks up to him. Now, I, I want you to understand, when you're reading the Bible, read it and look at it and when you see a pattern, identify that pattern and why is that pattern there, right? Jesus' first, ministry, first thing he did to, to Jewish people, a, a demon-possessed man. The first thing he's doing in Gentile country, a demon-possessed man. It seems as if Jesus is from the outset, or at least the way Mark is trying to tell the story, is to, to, to draw us into this, this fact that, that Jesus is intent on dealing with the spiritual problem that is at place in our world above all else. That is his first thing he goes after. Okay, so uh, I, think, I think it's just significant. We gotta pay attention to those kinds of things. Look at verse three. It says, he lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Man, this guy is a gnarly dude, right? I mean, he is, he is like really like, He's, he's got it bad. And he is, he is in this place where he's living amongst the tombs. He's living amongst these dead people. And, and Jesus like comes out. He, he shows up uh, to Jesus. He's, he's described as naked. He's described as crying out and yelling at the top of his lungs. He's described um, as out of his mind. He breaks. He's, he's described as this very strong guy. You could just break chains break ropes like anything you try and subdue him with it does not hold him down now this is significant because in mark chapter 3 jesus tells a story about a strong man maybe you'll remember this jesus talks about in a parable he says if you're going to take uh control of a house if you're going to steal from a house you must first tie up the the strong man you must tie up the one who is controlling that house. And there's this, there's this aspect here where Jesus is trying to help us see the strength and the power of our enemy. That he is not some weak house pet that can be tamed. That our enemy is strong. Yeah, he is a very, very strong being. And his whole desire and his whole goal is to wreak havoc on human life. God created you in his image to be image bearers and bring about his rule and his reign here on earth as it is in heaven, and he hates that. And he will do anything and everything to destroy that in us and destroy our identity and he will come after us and he will wreck havoc and he is strong he is powerful he is mighty and some of you know that far too well that he cannot be tamed 
with all the things that we want to try and tame him with. Right? This can be said about sin as well. That our sin, we can't try and tame it. We have to get rid of it. We have to get rid of it as much as we possibly can. And I'll uh, share a little bit more about how that happens here in just a second. Look at verse 6. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. I love this idea. You see three actions that this guy takes. He, ra- he saw Jesus, he ran to Jesus, and he fell down before Jesus. I think that that is, that we need to just let this verse seep into our hearts and our souls. Because here, here's the reality, is that uh, we need to ask ourselves, when we see Jesus, do we run to him and do we fall down before him? Have we done that with ourselves? Have we postured ourselves in a place of surrender? Have we said, have we said like, oh man, like he is almighty. He is all powerful. He is great and wondrous. Have we seen Jesus for who he is and ran to be with him and fall down before him? There's something deep and meaningful about that kind of surrender. And we're going to see what takes place because of that surrender. Verse 7, he says, And crying out in a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of this man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion. For we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on a hillside. And they begged him, send us into the pigs. Let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirit came out and entered the pigs. And the herds, numbering about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. And that's why we're having barbecue today. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> All right. So no, this is, this is, this is uh, no joke. So uh, we're, we're, sitting, we're sitting up in this room uh, a few weeks ago. All right. And, uh, or maybe a month or two ago. I don't know how long ago it was, but it was a while ago. We were planning out this series as a team. And I just wrote, they were like, what creative ideas do we have? And I jokingly typed in pig picking. And then Brian, you guys should all thank Brian. Brian was like, we should do that. Like, we should, we should definitely do that. And so Brian made it happen. So praise God for Brian. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, this is, this, is, uh, this is one of those really, really significant moments uh, that we see in any story. Uh, because I think that this is, this is like such a great picture of the way the enemy just wants to come in and wreak havoc in someone's life and in our life and in my life and in your life. He just wants to do that. And yet when you call on the name of Jesus, he has no power over you because Jesus will just do away with the strongest of strong men. See, the, the reality is, is that this guy is de- like defined as a strong man that no one can subdue, and yet he is no match for Jesus. And the interesting thing about it is that he knows it. He knows he's no match for Jesus. Before he even starts, he's begging Jesus, Jesus, just send us out to those pigs. Just don't torment us. Just don't torture us. Not only do you have the power to subdue us, Jesus, but you have the power to torture us. Just don't do that. See, he can't be subdued by anything or anyone, but he is no match for Jesus, and he knows it. He knows it. Do you know it? Whatever it is that you are facing, whatever it is that you are going through, and whatever it is that seems to be attacking you, and whatever the enemy is doing to try and wreak havoc on your life has no power over you if you have Christ. We should take confidence and hope in that. 
This should fill us with hope to know that, man, like the enemy is strong, but our God is stronger, and there's nothing that he can't defeat if we call on his name. If we surrender to his power, there's nothing he can't do. And we just have to give ourselves to this truth. Believe this truth wholeheartedly. I love it. I love it. This, uh, this idea, um, he says, he, he, Jesus asked this, this, the demons, he says, well, what was your name? He says, well, our name is Legion because we are many. The idea uh, of this, this idea of a legion was a common Roman idea. Uh, so uh, 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 a legion was a, a troop of soldiers in the Roman military numbering about 5,000. So large number, and many people in the world, in the ancient world at that time, if a, if a legion began to march against your city, you knew, like, we're done. Like, there's nothing that we can do to stop them. They are going to take what they want to take, and they're going to do what they want to do. So we might as well just surrender, because we don't have any chance to defeat them. And the fact that he says, well, we're a legion, everyone, everyone like, that, that, that should throw off in our mind if we're reading this, like, oh, so you're undefeatable, except if you're Jesus. I love uh, also the idea that takes place, and, uh, and, and so, so he sends the demons into this herd of pigs, and the Bible says about 2,000 go off into the sea. Uh, if you read Genesis chapter 1, on day five, uh, the, the, if you're reading the NIV or the ESV, it would say something like God created the creatures of the sea, okay? Um, if you read the NRSV and the NASB, which typically are the most commonly used translations in like seminaries and Bible colleges, most people believe that they're our best rendering from, from any like ancient language into English um, is the NRSV and the, the NASB. They say sea monsters. That on day five of creation, God created the sea monsters. And uh, you see, uh, it's interesting because one of these sea monsters ends up on dry land on day three. The same word that's used to, to describe the creatures that God created on day five uh, shows up on dry land in Genesis 3. You guys probably can guess which creature that is. Uh, and and, uh, and it's, it's often translated the snake or the serpent. Uh, and uh, you can trace these these. Uh, these names and these words used to describe these sea monsters all the way through the Old Testament in the book of Psalms, uh, through the prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah and, uh, and, and Daniel, you, you see this re revolving theme. You see it in a book called Jonah, where Jonah is swallowed by a big fish. Uh, you know, this idea is prevalent in the Old Testament scriptures of these, these sea monsters. Uh, in the Greek, when, when the Old Testament was translated into Greek, it's called the Septuagint. When they translated the Old Testament into Greek for uh, Greek-speaking Jews to be able to read uh, in, like, in and around uh, probably just before Jesus was on the scene, um, they, they, uh, they titled these creatures, they, there's like three different names, but they titled them all with one word in Greek, and it's the word dragon. And we don't hear a lot about dragons uh, in the New Testament until you get to Revelation, right? And then you, you begin to hear more. So I don't have a whole lot of time to unpack all of this, right? But the idea that is prevalent in, uh, in around the, 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 the scriptures and the text is that there are these sea monsters that are, man, they are some bad things bad things they are they are some really powerful strong cunning like monsters and they live in the sea right they live in the chaos waters which is another theme throughout the old testament and then you 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 can brave your way into the sea if you want as a human being but you better know that they're out there right like that's that's the idea 
I love the idea that Jesus sends these pigs, and these pigs go running down into the sea, because to me, when I read it, knowing that, right, having that context, I read it going, Jesus is putting the monsters where they belong. He's taking the monsters back, and he's putting them back where they belong. And, you know, that may not mean anything to you. You may be like, Derek, are you, like, saying that there's dragons? I'm like, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe there is. Um, so, uh, I, but, but what I can tell you is that there, there were these creatures that were referred to, to to bestow, like, this idea of power and evil and death and destruction that were talked about all throughout the Hebrew Bible uh, to give people a glimpse and, uh, and I think that that's what's happening here. It's a very similar type of creature is at play. And Jesus is putting him in his place. I love that. Um, you keep going. Uh, let's keep reading. Verse 14 and 15. It says, The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And the people came to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. Um, look at me for just a second. I, I think it's important that we ask the question, are you forever changed by the power of Jesus? Are you forever changed by the power of Jesus? One of the things that I notice so distinctly and so readily here in this text is that this guy is not who he once was. He is not who he once was. The earlier part of the text describes him as naked, out of his mind, crazy, like cutting himself with stones, yelling out at night, and then this part of the passage, after he's encountered with Jesus, had an encounter with Jesus, he's completely transformed and changed. And can, you, can, can I tell you why this is so important to me? Is because I believe there are so many people, so many people who have um, encountered Jesus or talked about having an encounter with Jesus or expressed some sort of conversion experience of where they, they knew that they were a sinner and they accepted Jesus as their savior and they invited Jesus to come and live in their heart. And there's a, there's a, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna address all of that, but, but I think, I think the, the problem that I have with that is when people say those things and yet they look no different than they did the day that they said, I accepted Jesus. There's no transformation. There's no authentic change. They meet Jesus. They've been living amongst the dead. They've been living amongst the tombs. And then they meet Jesus and they just go back to the tombs. Do you understand what I'm saying? It, that's, that's not what happens when you have an authentic encounter and conversion experience with Christ. You are left changed and everyone sees it. Everyone notices it. The, the change is just undeniable. It's a complete 180, which is what the re word repent means, by the way. It means to turn a 180, to just make a 180. And I just, I'm saddened by the fact that I come in contact with so many people who say that they're followers of Jesus, and yet they look exactly like they did the day that they said they became a believer. So I don't think that that's, I don't think that's how it works. You know, a lot of people, and here's why I think this is a problem. A lot of people believe that you can invite Jesus into your heart, invite Jesus into your life. And I'm not saying that, that I'm, not, I'm gonna get into all the theological weeds behind that. But I don't think that that's the best theological idea that we see from the scriptures. I don't think Jesus is really interested in you inviting him into your heart. I think what he is interested in is you surrendering your life to follow him. He's interested in you running down, bowing down, surrendering your life and doing what he calls you to do. 
not saying, hey, you know what, Jesus, can you come live and be a part of my life and I'll just, I'm just gonna keep doing what I've always done, I'm just gonna put you on top of it. You get what I'm saying? And I know a lot of people say, well, no, Jesus does that. No, that's what Jesus does. Like the only time I even see a remote picture of that kind of inviting Jesus in is in Revelation when he is knocking on the door of a church that has locked him out. There's a group of people who call themselves Christians but have locked him out of their life. And he's knocking on the door and he says to them, I'm knocking, I'm standing, I'm knocking, open the door and I'll come in and I'll have communion with you. I'll break bread with you. I will have a relationship with you if you'll just open the door. But you gotta open the door. And then when he comes in, he's gonna break bread with you and he's gonna start changing you and transforming you and calling you to change and transform. If you wanna continue to be the same person, you might as well just keep the door shut. You get what I'm saying? So I think we have to understand this because I think, it's, I think it's just a flawed way of thinking to say, like, Jesus, like, we, we, we're inviting Jesus into our, no, we're, we are called to follow him, and that means surrender. That means we die to ourselves to follow him. It does not mean, um, and, and if we do that, he will be with us. And he will have communion with us and he will have relationship with us and we have access to him at any point in time and all of those kinds of things because we have surrendered. But the idea of saying, Jesus, come live in my heart, like that's not, it's not in the Bible. And so we have to ask ourselves, do we bought into a false, false truth that isn't, isn't actually real? And are we actually changed and transformed by the power of Jesus or not? Have we had an authentic experience with Christ or not? Because if we had, everybody will notice. Everyone will notice. Look at verse um, 16. It says, And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Let us not be offended by the fact that people can see the power of Christ at work and still deny it. They can see God doing something incredible and amazing that no one else can do. And they'll they'll say, no, 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 no. Like, I don't want to have anything to do with the guy that can do that. Right? Right? Let us not be offended when there are people who just can't believe that Jesus can speak creation into existence because that's just outside of their framework of what's possible. Some people can see what God is capable of and they can just say, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And the interesting thing is, is when they do that, Jesus doesn't go, oh, but don't you want to follow me? Don't you want to be my disciple? This is, this is why I truly believe that there is a heaven and there is a hell. There is a place uh, and, and, and a space where we have eternal union with God, and there is a space and a place where we are eternally separated from God. And if we choose to separate ourselves from God, he's not going to, tr- he's not going to be like, oh, nope, you have to live in No, he's not going to make you do that. He's inviting you to do that. A lot of people, a lot of people question like, how could God be loving if he's going to send people to hell? God doesn't send anybody to hell. We send ourselves. Jesus has done everything he can do to pull us out of hell. If we choose to go to hell, it's our own choice. He did not send us there, does not send us there. He is a loving God that gives everyone an opportunity to find repentance and come and be with him. But he's not going to force you to it. In fact, when these people ask him to leave, 
he just gets in the boat. <laughs> They're like, Jesus, will you please leave? He's like, sure, I'll leave. Yeah, you know. I'm not going to try and convince. I, I don't have, I, I'm not playing games here. You don't want what I have to offer? That's fine. I'll just go to the next person. So don't be discouraged when you're trying to win someone over for Christ. Keep praying for them. Keep loving them like Jesus would love them. Jesus isn't angry with these people. He doesn't berate them. He doesn't, he just, he gives them the space that they ask for, right? You might have a friend one day that you're trying to reach for Christ. Say, you know what, hey man, like I, I really appreciate you and appreciate your friendship, but like could you just give me some space on this whole Jesus thing? And I would encourage you to remember this passage and just go, yeah, sure, no problem. I'll give you the space that you need. I'm here if you ever need me. I'm right here. You ever want to know more? I'm right here. Right? Verse 18 says, He was getting in the boat, and the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might go with him. I love the description of this guy. He, he had been possessed. You know, this is past tense now. I love this idea that, like, man, this is, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about transformation. We're talking about change. Right? And maybe, maybe you, uh, before you knew Jesus, you had been addicted, but you are no more. Praise God. Maybe before you knew Jesus, you had been dealing with anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts, but now because you know Jesus, you are no more. Praise God. Maybe, you know, you were dealing with an illness or you were dealing with a sickness or a disease and, and God healed you from that. The, the powerful thing is, is that with Jesus, who we were isn't who we have to be. That he can change and transform our lives in many, many powerful ways in which we feel captive, in which we feel trapped. He has the power to overcome it all and change our story and make us a has-been we used to be this, but now we're something new. That's the power of the gospel. Verse 19 says, and he did not permit him. So interesting, right? Jesus, this guy wants to go to Jesus. That's such a great desire. He just wants to be with Jesus. We talk about that at our church all the time, right? The idea of being with Jesus is so important. We want to have that desire. This guy has that desire. How cool is that? He wants to be with Jesus. Man, and Jesus goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> now you go home. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. So... I think it's so, so interesting. This guy wants to be with Jesus, wants to go to be with Jesus, and Jesus tells this homeless man to go home. Right? I mean, he's been living amongst the tombs, living amongst dead people. He has no home to speak of, and Jesus says, no, no, you go home. Go home. And this guy could go, well, I don't have a home. I've been, I've been living in the tombs. You want me to go back to the tombs? No, 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 don't go, don't go live back amongst dead people. That, that, right? You need to go home. Go to your family. Go to your friends. Go to the people who know you. Go to the people who knew what happened to you. Go to them and proclaim the gospel. Share with them the good news about what God has done in your life. I, 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 think, I think it's such a such a, 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 a neat image to think that Jesus would say to a homeless man, go home. You have a home again. Go back there. Be with your people. Share the gospel with them. It is, uh, it is, a, is a beautiful, beautiful um, reality that Jesus can take us from a place where we don't belong anywhere to where um, we belong again uh, everywhere. 
there's this um, there's this problem that I haven't addressed yet about this demon possession and how the enemy had taken hold of this man's life, and I don't I don't know uh, this, but but I but I tend to think that like what we do see in this man is that he is living alone. He's isolated. He's by himself. And I just, if you don't know, that is the place where the enemy just has a field day. He has a field day with people who find themselves isolated and in a place where they have no real people to be around them, no family, no friends, no community. And, and that is a place where the enemy can just wreck havoc. You cannot, you cannot, and you will not ever be able to follow Jesus by yourself. It has never happened. There's never been one person who's ever followed Jesus alone. Never. The first disciple Jesus called, he called two <laughs> at the same time. You, you, you cannot follow Jesus alone and if you try you're going to isolate yourself in a way that just allows the enemy to come in and wreak havoc in your life and I want to challenge you one of the most powerful gifts that God gives to his followers is other followers or other people to join arm in arm with and hand in hand with and walk alongside of because he truly, truly wants to keep you free from the enemy. And one of the best places to do that is in, is in community with other people. Um, and so if you, for some reason, feel alone or you think that you are alone, and my guess is you probably are struggling in life right now. And loneliness is a craze of our world. We are the loneliest generation of people that have ever lived on the earth, and yet we have all these ways to stay connected. And yet most of us, if you like over 50% of people would say, yeah, I feel lonely most of the time. We, we have to engage with Jesus' framework of entering into life-on-life -life relationship and community with one another. Or else, man, we are just going to get beat up. Beat up. But I love the fact that this guy is able to go back to his community. He's able to go back to his family, his friends, get around people again. Because previously he couldn't, or he didn't feel like he could. I want you to know that that option with Jesus is always open. When you're in a relationship with Jesus, there are other people that you can always find um, and, and connect with and be in relationship with. And I want to challenge you to do that. Challenge you to do that. Uh, this is also significant because this guy is a Gentile. Uh, as we talked about, uh, he is he's a Gentile. And... Um, you know, in, in Genesis chapter 11, there's this, there's this scene of where all the people of the world are trying to make a name for themselves, the Bible says. It says they're trying to make a name for themselves. So they decide they're going to build this tower up to the heavens, right? The heavens being this place where God lives and God dwells. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to ascend to the heights of God. They, they're trying to make a name for themselves. They're trying to become gods. That's, that's legitimately the picture that you see in Genesis chapter 11. It's is human beings are trying to become gods for themselves. Do we do this still or what? Can I, you know, like trying to make a name for ourselves? Like this happens all the time still, right? But what God does is as they're trying to build this tower is he, 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 he disperses them by giving them all different languages to speak. And so that they can't communicate to actually build this tower because they can't understand each other. I mean, it's like this fascinating tool that God uses, but what does he do when he does it? He creates the nations. He creates all the people of the world by doing that. Now, <laughs> in Genesis chapter 12, the very next chapter, God selects one guy from one nation. His name's Abram. And he makes a promise to Abram. 
And he says, I'm gonna bless your people. I'm gonna make you as numerous as the sand of the seashore. Like you are gonna be blessed, your, 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 your descendants will be blessed, like everyone will be blessed. And then you see that actually start to take place. Like all throughout. Like you have these like really, really awful people being blessed. Like Jacob. Jacob is, Jacob is um, a horrible dude. <laughs> And yet he, he is just blessed beyond belief by God because he's a part of this family. Now, so God keeps his promise. But he also says in Genesis chapter 12, I'm gonna bless all nations through you. Now, Jesus was an Israelite. Jesus was a part of this blessed people. And Jesus shows up and he saves the life of this person who's not a part of that blessed family, who's a part of the nations. And he says, now you go and you tell the good news to everybody. They go, listen. This is the beginning of Jesus fulfilling the promise that he made in Genesis chapter 12, that I'm gonna bless all people, all nations through you. And Jesus does. Jesus does. Really, really powerful thing. A lot of people will use this as an ideology to uh, proclaim um, that um, to actually defend the segregation of the church. I don't think it's any secret that, you know, the most segregated hour of any week in the United States is Sunday morning between the hours of 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. It's the most segregated hour in our country. Man, that's sad. At least I think it's sad. But there are a lot of people that will use this as a defense. Well, you know, you reach the people who are like you. You know? Like Jesus sent out this Gentile guy to reach the Gentiles. And, you know, him and his disciples went to the Jews. and So forth and so on. And that's, that's fine. If you, if you want to use the Bible that way. That's fine. Well, what I know is that Jesus died on a cross and Jesus rose from the dead. And then Jesus told his disciples that when the, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, I want you to proclaim this gospel. And they begin to do that in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, Everyone begins to speak in their own language, but they all understand each other again. Isn't that crazy? The power of God, the power of the Spirit, and the power of the gospel, that even though they're a part of different nations, they all hear the same message, that they're all united under the same message, that they all come to love one another and live in community with one another because of this message that there is this God who blesses all nations. And my, my only thing is, is like, man, if, if our hope and our, our goal and our job is to bring heaven here on earth, what a better way to do that than by getting the nations together to worship It's one of the sad realities that I think I see every week in America is that the nations are divided, worshiping in their own buildings instead of united like they will be when we reach heaven. I want to see heaven come to earth, and that's one way we can do it. If we can just say, you know what? It doesn't matter if they're different than me. It doesn't matter if they come from the same place I come from. We're a part of the same family. That's beautiful. That's the gospel. And if we're going to worship together in heaven, we might as well start now. I just think this is such a powerful, powerful thing that we see in the gospel and that we oftentimes just read over. 
Most people would read over that text in, in Mark 5 and be like, oh yeah, Jesus, you know, cast out a demon from some Gentile. Awesome. But what that means, <laughs> the power that that has for us right now is significant. And we should go after it. <laughs> we should go after it if we want to bring heaven here on earth. Let's pray. God, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for just the chance we have to be here. Thank you for just you bringing us uh, through this text and uh, having mercy on us for the places where uh, we fail. Um, having mercy on us for the places where we miss it. God, I pray that you would just work in our hearts and in our minds as we wrestle with this story. God, may we put ourselves in it, go back and read it again and again and again. God, that we would find ourselves surrendered before you. Ready to follow you, to do whatever it is you call us to. God, I pray that we see you in this moment, that we run toward you and we fall down at your feet. We lay everything before you, all of the junk and all of the pain, all of the demons that torment us, the spiritual forces of evil that are trying to wreak havoc in our life. God, I pray we just... Give those all to you. Submit all of those things to your authority. And God, we pray by your name that you give us freedom. By the power of your spirit that you would give us hope and life. God, that we would be forever changed. That who we once were will not be who we are anymore. We love you. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.